Okay, great. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm Tim Vollmer. I'm from the UC Berkeley Library's Office of Scholarly Communication Services. And um, our office serves the entire library and the campus. And what we do is we help students, faculty, and scholars understand uh, publishing, copyright and information policy, um, and other sort of issues around publishing in their research uh, and teaching um, and scholarship in general. So this is our final uh, workshop for our fall series. Um, but you can see here, we've covered quite a bit of topics this uh, semester. Um, so back in September, we uh, highlighted uh, Pressbooks, which is a platform to publish digital books and other open educational resources. Um, we also held a workshop on uh, for, for um, PhD candidates looking to consider copyright issues in their dissertation. Um, we held a workshop on managing and maximizing scholarly impact. So how to understand scholarly metrics and how to increase the impact of your scholarship. Um, and then uh, a few weeks ago, we did a workshop on how to engage in publishing open access and the various um, assistance things at Berkeley and venues that we have for researchers to be able to publish open access um, at Berkeley. So we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our uh, uh, workshop series for this fall, but I'll put in the chat here just our general website where we have a lot of information and we'll add other events that we're doing um, there to the website as they come up. And then another thing I'm just going to add is our office email address to the chat. So um, if you ever, ever have any questions about copyright, scholarly publishing, open access, those types of issues, you should feel free to um, reach out to us and we're happy to, happy to help. So today we've got an awesome lineup of speakers who um, have generously agreed to share their expertise on the process of publishing a scholarly book. So perhaps some of you are working on your dissertation or are just more generally interested in taking research into a book length treatment. So our goal with the conversation today is to help sort of demystify some of the scholarly book publishing process a little bit um, and to give you some practical advice on a variety of issues like what it's gonna take to revise your dissertation, um, how to develop a book proposal, um, some tips for interacting with uh, editors, um, and also some discussion around how to address some of the legal considerations that you might see come up in the book publishing uh, process. So now I just wanna introduce uh, our panelists for today. Uh, so Reina Polivka is Senior Acquisitions Editor at the University of California Press. Uh, and there she focuses on book projects in uh, film, media and sound studies. Uh, and Raina joined UC Press in 2015. Um, she's been a lead coordinator for the press on the First Gen Scholars program. Um, and this program seeks to cultivate and support the work of students and scholars who are first in their family to receive a college degree. Uh, next up, Rebecca Perlman is an assistant professor of political science at UC Berkeley. And her primary field of research is international political economy with a focus on regulatory politics, the governance of multinational firms and environmental policy. Now, Professor Perlman recently published a book with Cambridge University Press titled Regulating Risk, How Private Information Shapes Global Safety Standards. And Rachel Brooke is senior staff attorney at Authors Alliance. And Authors Alliance is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance the interests of authors who want to serve the public good by sharing their creations more broadly. And Rachel has also worked as a literary agent um, at a New York City agency. So thank you to our speakers and welcome everyone today. So just a little bit about the structure of the discussion. So we've prepared a short set of questions that are tailored to each individual panelist's role and experiences within the book publication process. So we're gonna use the first part of the session to talk with 
each of our panelists separately. So we'll start with Reina and then go to Rebecca and then end with Rachel. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll turn off the recording and there'll be time for you to ask questions of any of our panelists today too. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen sharing just so it's easier to see our speakers as we begin um, the conversation today. Okay, great. Um, well, like I said, let's start with uh, let's start with Reina today. So, Reina, um, the first question I want you to talk a little bit about is: Can you just give us a broad overview of, of what the University of Cali California Press is? So, what sorts of books does UC Press publish, and could you talk about um, whether there's any specializations that UC Press covers uh, versus other university presses? Yeah, sure. Happy to, Tim. And hello, everyone. Thanks so much for um, joining today. Um, so UC Press is celebrating its 130 year anniversary this year. Um, we publish largely and primarily in the humanities and social sciences um, with burgeoning lists, I think, in um, economics, technology studies and environmental um, and environmental studies. Um, we are typically uh, associated with some of the, um, the, as one of the top publishers in the areas we, we um, acquire in. So that's everything from sociology to anthropology, history, um, ancient history up to the present day, American studies, music, film media, um, et cetera. And I encourage you, um, and we'll touch upon this later, I think during the conversation to really explore our website to get a really good sense of the areas that we have strengths in, um, as well as um, some of the series that we publish in. I think one of the things that really distinguishes UC Press from some of our peer presses is that we celebrate interdisciplinarity. Uh, many of our uh, acquisitions and titles cross over to multiple areas of interest. Um, and we do celebrate that as an organization, we have a culture of kind of um, information sharing. And so often authors that I acquire, their projects will appear at conferences um, that my colleagues are attending in American studies or uh, American history, et cetera. So we do, or Middle East studies, for example. So we do do a lot of kind of interdisciplinary um, collaborative work at UC Press. We primarily um, uh, acquire monographs. And of course, a monograph is that long form uh, scholarly genre that many of you will be turning your dissertation into or writing as your first book. These are typically geared towards smaller audiences of experts in fields. Um, we also publish uh, academic trade books. These books are um, have kind of a more scholarly apparatus and a unique argument, but might have a topic that that pertains to um, kind of contemporary or current events um, that is has access points for larger and more expansive audiences that is written maybe by an author who has a more public facing platform. Maybe they've written for other kinds of journals or commercial kind of um, public facing publications. Uh, we do also publish a robust trade list. These are um, general books of general um, topics that are really synthetic primarily in their exploration and um, and are geared towards that very large expansive audience. I'll also say one last thing about what we do at UC Press and that is that we do strongly believe in open access publishing and we have our own open access um, publishing program called Luminos, um, which I'm happy to answer questions about at a later time. But we have this wide portfolio of different, we call them product types, um, to provide our authors with different kinds of, uh, to, to, to acquire, I think, a diverse array of voices um, for people that want to explore these subject areas in different kinds of ways. Great, great. Well, let's explore some of the stages of the book publication process from the perspective of the press or you as an editor. So mm -hmm. say I'm a PhD student and I have a dissertation. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, that I want to revise it into a book. Like, where do I start? What things should like a prospective book author be thinking about or doing before they even ever try to contact a particular publisher about the possibility of a book? 
Yeah, great question. And I'm sure Rebecca will probably <laughs> chime in on a similar topic as well. I would say that the first thing you should do is perhaps just tuck the dissertation away for a little bit and take some time out um, from that particular document to read widely and to read um, to, to read as a writer. The, th the difference between the dissertation and the book is vast, and it's important to understand that the book is going to look very different from the dissertation. Of course, the dissertation is written under duress. Um, <laughs> in many ways, you're, you're asked to do probably departmental service. You have your own personal lives. You're teaching. You have grant funding to worry about. You have all of these pressures on you. Um, and and it's, it's really kind of an exercise in a, in a specific way of demonstrating mastery right of a topic the book itself is is you are you are you are the expert and you need to build reader buy-in to have us follow you throughout the pages of the book and so when you tuck that away read widely as a writer what are people doing in their book in their books that is successful how are they approaching their topic what are how are they telling their stories what kinds of um, invitations are they um, providing for the reader to to join them in that in that scholarship, um, and what's not working for certain books? So I think that that's a really good way to kind of you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You read read uh, read what other people are doing and how. Um, during that time, I I really suggest kind of. Um, attending conferences and test driving some of your material. I think a dissertation is a great document that you can get a lot of mileage from. Maybe a chapter could be punted off into a journal article. Um, I, I always um, encourage, especially first time authors to try and get, if you can, at least one journal article published prior to the book. This really kind of seeds the marketplace. It puts your name out there as an expert in that particular topic or in that particular area. Um, it introduces you to things like peer review and all these processes that are very idiosyncratic to academic publishing, but very key to what we do. Um, and using your, from your dissertation, kind of test driving material at conferences, at panels, at talks. What are things that are like really working? What are people interested in? How are trying to present the top, the 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 research and the the work that you've done from different angles, right? What is the angle that really lands with specific readers? Is there a way to approach this differently than you did in the dissertation that could could really develop into a long form book project? Um, so those are some some minor things I think you can do. The other thing, and and um, during that time is to start researching different presses, right? Where would be a good home for your work? Um, this can easily be done at the professional conferences that you attend, those spaces that you kind of populate naturally as a scholar, um, visiting those exhibit halls and picking up those books and, you know, handling the materiality of that, that object. What feels good? What are the kind of looking at um, the different titles that a press is publishing gives you a really good sense of what that editor's focus is on um, in terms of acquisitions. Mm -hmm. I will say that typically you can get a good sense for where a press is headed um, in their acquisitions by looking at publications um, within the last three, three years. <clears throat> Anything beyond that could be seen as a classic or something that's a holdout from a from an inherited list. So really look at what's been coming out from particular presses within that last three year period. Um, so, so doing that kind of research, again, looking at book series that different publishers are publishing in. Um, book series can be really helpful for getting your foot in the door sometimes because often series editors serve as ambassadors of presses, right? And whereas an acquisitions editor may have, there's lots of noise, there's lots of submissions, there's lots of material that they have to go through, a series editor might be a great intro into that acquisitions editor's kind of inbox. Um, so look through series and then Always mobilize your mentors and your contacts and your peers as much as you can. I think that word of mouth is one of the best ways to kind of navigate that field early on in your career. Where have your um, colleagues been publishing? Um, what, you know, what are some other books that have come out recently that you see yours lining up to? So, you know, kind of getting out um, boots on the ground, um, sniffing out the opportunities and trying to figure out um, 
what material can be shaped into the book and what can be punted towards um, other kinds of, of writing outlets. Great, great. Well, let's say I'm the, I've done some of that research and I think UC Press might be a good fit. How do you, how would I begin an interaction with the press and you in a productive and effective fashion? Can you give us some like tips or thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, again, I think especially now that we're um, hopefully back in person for the foreseeable future, taking those opportunities to have a face-to-face -face interaction with an editor can be really helpful. Um, passing along your business card, even having a small conversation like, hey, I'm I'm not quite at the proposal stage yet, but I'm, you know, I'm writing about this. Does this sound of interest to, to you in the press? Could I approach you later when I have something more formal to share? These kinds of informal conversations at that very early stage can be really beneficial for you to kind of um, to weed out the chaff, right? Like, oh, well, that that editor does not seem interested. I'll, I'll just cross that off my list. Um, but also for an editor to have that 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 recollection, that FaceTime, um, that human interaction as we um, stay in touch. I think when you have that, when, when you request like an official sit down with an editor, whether that is at a conference or on Zoom, um, it's really good to have that proposal pretty well formulated. Um, so you have a very clear sense of the arc of the book, of what the book will do, of what it will contribute to, um, and at least one, preferably two, pretty polished chapters um, that should appear in that that are meant to appear in the in the book. Um, so this is at the stage where, for all intents and purposes, you're ready to share that material with an editor and potentially in peer review. Um, so at that point, it's a good idea to reach out to, to presses and to editors that you're interested in, with whom you're interested in meeting. Um, one of the things that I would suggest not doing during that meeting with an editor uh, is going exhaustively chapter by chapter um, about your book project. You really only have, you know, 20 to 30 minutes in that time typically with an editor. And so try to make the most of that time together. I think talking about, you know, the, having that elevator pitch really honed in, those three sentences that kind of sum up what the project is, why it's original and unique, and why you think it should be published by that particular press. Um, this is a great opener to any conversation with an editor. At that point, you know, the dialogue will continue. Is there a specific methodology, some archives you want to talk about? Um, those things will, will, I think, come naturally once there's that initial kind of statement, right? Some things to ask the editor too. Um, how long does your peer review process take? Would you consider peer review based on a proposal and sample chapters or do you wanna see the full manuscript? Um, what does your production timeline look like? What kind of marketing could I expect from the press? So this is an opportunity to kind of, for, for, for both parties to really learn about each other, right? Terrific. I think you're kind of leading into this, but could you talk a little bit more about what goes into a, a formal book proposal um, and what catches your attention as an editor for an interesting sort of book project through the proposal? Definitely. Well, I think again, a book proposal is a genre unto itself. Um, <laughs> and I always, I, I always tell authors to think about the audience at every step for whatever they're writing. This is a good um, general rule. But a proposal at UC Press will be seen by three main parties. One, of course, the acquisitions editor. Two are uh, the peer reviewers, if we send it out for peer review with sample chapters. And three, at UC Press, we share proposals with our internal board, which approves contracts. This is composed of marketing colleagues, production colleagues, and press leadership. And that's really meant to create buy-in among the entire organization for that project, to create a sense of ownership over that, um, the, that final product that we'll work together to put out in the world with the author. Um, so for the acquisitions editor, you know, I think a proposal could be is typically around the uh, eight to 15 page 
length. I know that's quite a range. Um, but for me, at least, the proposal is um, an opportunity to um, convey your vision for the work. Um, it should begin with a, um, a summary of the project, um, putting forth its unique argument. What is the thing, the exciting thing that you're bringing to the table? I think oftentimes first book authors will pitch their projects um, in terms of a lack, right? There's a lack of work done in this area. And so my work fills that gap. Rather than talk in those terms of paucity or negativity, talk about what your book is doing that's exciting and new and a fresh take. Um, so the proposal is kind of like a marketing document in a way. It's a pitch, right? You're pitching your book. What are the hooks that will that will take us, that will, um, that will kind of hang our hat on to continue down the road with you. So, so the, the synopsis and the argument, you'll do a, um, uh, kind of a, a marketing assessment. What are the books that are currently published that your work is in conversation with? Um, are these, we call this kind of the competing complementary um, title assessment. So listing around five titles not necessarily published by that university press, but but certainly within that world that you think your book would sit next to on a bookshelf, right? What is it? Um, how is your book different? How is it engaging with those books? Um, and that will help the, the press and the acquisitions editor and those peer reviewers get a sense of your understanding of, of, of how you're positioning your work in the scholarly literature. You'll also include a table of contents, um, which we ask for, I think most presses ask for like an abstract for each of those chapters. Um, those chapters are an important uh, way to, to kind of map out the book, right? Um, and so we're looking at chapter titles. They should not read like symposium papers with like <laughs> long titles that go multiple lines long. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they should really capture the main idea that, you know, use that creative muscle there for those for those chapter titles. And then in the annotation or the abstract, it should be clear the connective tissue that's running throughout the book. How is your argument building from chapter to chapter? Um, I think too often or very often in the dissertation, you're kind of writing um you're, you're parceling out your your writing the about an idea right in the book it really needs to show that you you're writing through the idea to the very end um what kinds of case studies are you marshalling for your for support what kinds of methodologies or theories are you engaging with this should all be clear in that annotated table of contents of the project. So these are things like uh, your images or art, music examples, AV, any of those kinds of supplementary materials that should make their way into the book should appear there. A little bit about if anything has been previously published, like in an, a journal article. Um, and then finally, we ask that you include a list of potential peer reviewers. Um, this is especially important if you, oh, am I slowing down? Keep going, I think it's fine. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, the, uh, the, your list of peer reviewers, especially if you're working interdisciplinarily, um, will want to see that you can you you can recognize those scholars who can weigh in on both sides of the table great um Raina, the last thing i want to ask about um before we move on is can you talk about what happens after the book has been contracted so during the sort of revision process and then the publishing of course as well so can you talk a little bit about what expectations you have for authors as they go through this revision process. And then I think another thing people will be interested in is what does the time frame sort of look like from proposal to published book for, for UC Press? Yeah, um, great. So typically the way my practice is such that when I receive a proposal and sample chapters that I'm keen to, um, to pursue, 
that's my opportunity to really dig in and work through the proposal and those sample chapters with the author um, to make sure that those sample chapters are really fulfilling the promises made in the proposal. Um, to think even at these early stages about style and about approach. My expertise as an editor is lent to the process by virtue of being like an expert reader. I might not be an expert in the subject in the in the topic of the book itself, um, but I do know what makes a really good read. And so I work with authors to achieve to help them achieve what the uh, what they would wish to achieve with the book in terms of audience and readership. Um, I really lean on those peer reviewers then to serve as the experts on the content. So they're the ones that are looking at are all the the sources cited, you know, is there anyone that's missing from the bibliography, et cetera. Um, and so that early stage um, with the proposal and sample chapters, I think it, it it really gets us all on the same page in terms of the vision for the book. Um, and then once we have the contract signed, the author goes off and completes the manuscript. Um, and we do engage peer review a second time for that complete manuscript. And um, uh, and and that that you know that they're really kind of ex um, evaluating the whole work at that time. Hopefully, we can get the same readers on board again who are already familiar with that work. Um, I will say, you know, and maybe I'd be interested to hear Rebecca's experience with this as well. But I would say, on average, it's about two years between the time of submitting the proposal, getting it up through peer review and contracted to submitting those final files and having a book. Um, so I think, uh, you know, lots of things, especially as a first time author, going out on the job market, there's a lot of different timing pressures to be aware of. And so that's something to make sure you have conversations about with your acquisitions editor um, uh, all along the way. Fantastic. I feel like we're getting a, a secret look under the hood so that's super helpful. Let's bring Rebecca into the conversation now. Um, so Rebecca, I mean, you published a book last year, Regulating Risk, um, and it was with Cambridge University Press. So I want to explore some of the same questions that I asked Reina, but from your perspective as the author. So could you talk a little bit about where did the idea for your book um, start? And what did you do with your existing scholarship? Like, either your dissertation or other scholarly articles in thinking about um, starting a book project? Sure. Um, well, so my book really was kind of an expansion of the dissertation. Um, I definitely would second what Raina said about putting it, the dissertation aside for a bit. I think, you know, I had a dissertation I couldn't totally see, although it wasn't a book style. I mean, it had chapters. It wasn't a three paper dissertation. I, I wasn't totally sure what it needed to really expand out a little bit into a book. Um, so I took a little bit of time away from it. But I mean, the idea for that, you know, much like any dissertation idea, you know, I, I started with, you know, kind of a big question. Uh, I looked at various ways of pursuing it. Uh, it didn't work out. I tried different ways and I kind of iterated until I eventually found a, a dissertation that kind of came together. Um, so, I mean, that was, that was basically my process. Um, in terms of, I forget your your second question about uh, turning it into a book, or do you want to just repeat that? Sorry. Uh, the, the second question I had is, um, did, were there people that you went to for advice around thinking about a book? So did you talk with your colleagues or did you have advisors or mentors? Like, um, did you did you have any interaction with them? And what did they say in terms of starting a book project? Yeah, I mean, 100%. So my dissertation advisor, I leaned on heavily throughout the process. Um, I had no idea how to write a book, what the, pro you know, what the process looked like. Um, basically, you know, once you have the dissertation and you defend that, you then kind of need to turn this into some sort of something resembling a book manuscript, at which point you have a book workshop. Um, and then you get feedback from a bunch of different people. That's a really crucial phase. So just figuring out all those steps along the way. I leaned on my advisors, former advisors. I leaned on my colleagues um, at Princeton where I was at the time. Um, so, I mean, yes, just asking people who had written books, asking people 
who are more senior, um, I think definitely you want to be going to people for advice for this process. Great. Could you talk a little bit about the book proposal process for you? So um, what was your strategy in reaching out to potential publishers? And could you talk a little bit about what went into your specific book proposal, whether it was the same things that Raina talked about, or was it slightly different? And um, any tips or like things you thought were difficult or hard to, to manage around that process? Sure. Um, so early on in the process, I mean, before I had done the book workshop and things like that, I did have some, um, you know, former advisors connect me to people at various presses. And I, I met with them at conferences briefly. I kind of had, you know, 10 minute sit downs. And honestly, those didn't really turn into much in the sense that by the time that I really had the book ready, um, I mean, basically what they told me is you need a full book to, to propose, to have a real proposal. So I guess that's a little different than what Raina said. I think different presses is, presses work differently. And I think it depends if you're a first author, author or you published before. But for me, I was essentially told you need a full manuscript with all the chapters and at that point submit your proposal. Um, so when I had that, I then had various colleagues in different places who had connections to different presses, either they published there, um, you know, they knew the, the editors for whatever reasons. Um, they send an email introduction to those editors. Um, I then at that point had a proposal ready um, based on the web. I'd basically gone on the websites of the different presses. I'd seen what goes into a proposal. I'd written it up already. I had communicated with other colleagues. I'd had them read through my proposal. I got feedback on the proposal. Um, so that was, you know, basically what Raina said. You know, you have an abstract that, you know, is showing the kind of interest, what this book is really going to look like all the little chapter abstracts with the titles, um, you know, what other books are comparable, um, you know, what you'd published, I think was a, a final category previously, I, I published one article. Um, and so then at that point, once I had the introductions, all, you know, all the editors said, great, send your proposal. I sent my proposal and within, in some cases, a couple of days or, or within a day, even in some presses, they said, send your manuscript. Um, and at that point, I sent the full manuscript and um, I basically had responses with one, one person said immediately, I'm going to send this out to editors. That was Cambridge. Um, I think Princeton sat on it for a little bit. They have a much smaller press. They don't publish very much. They wanted to really think about whether they could publish it. Um, Oxford also very quickly sent it out to editors, uh, to reviewers, sorry. Um, so that was my process. Super interesting that they sort of wanted a full manuscript ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I guess I wouldn't have was... expected that, but that's... <laughs> Yes, it was fully okay. done by the time I, I reached out to people. I mean, to, to be clear, there were edits made following the peer review, but it was completed. Right. Okay. Um, let's have you talk a little bit about um, once your project was given the green light, um, can we talk a little bit about the publishing contract, which is something that all authors like sign with publishers? And it probably would be interest of people on the call here too, if they're thinking about publishing a book. So we're, were there any parts of the the publishing contract or the author agreement that jumped out to you? And did you attempt to negotiate particular things in your book contract? Yeah, so I basically, I mean, I, this was something that I, again, went to other colleagues for advice on, because, um, I mean, I think for all of this stuff, you should be leaning on your networks. Um, I think it's incredibly important. Um, so I, I had asked some, you know, my advisor and some other colleagues, what were the things that actually mattered in the contract? And basically what I was told, the only thing that matters is uh, the simultaneous release, if you can get it, of paperback and the hardcover. Um, because people other than libraries are not gonna buy the hardcover. It's way too expensive. It's like $150 or something. Um, obviously publishers love having that because it, you know, it's how they, I think still, I don't know, Raina can obviously speak to this more, but you know, historically it's been a really important way that publishers make back the money that they spend on authors to create this manuscript. Um, but it, it is hard for, you know, grad students, et cetera, et cetera to afford. Um, so I've been told if you want to get this book read, if you want to get it cited, and that's what matters for tenure, negotiate as hard as you can for a simultaneous release. Now, I will say that was not in my initial contract, and I was told it was impossible when I asked for it. Um, and what I basically said was I know four other colleagues at Princeton, and what I didn't mention was that they were all male, but I listed their names. And I said, they've all received simultaneous release of paperbacks in the past few years, and you were the editor on their projects. I would like a simultaneous release or I'm going with another press. And I got it. 
So uh, that was the one thing I negotiated hard on. Um, the other thing I, I did ask for um, was I knew that Cambridge can be really slow and I knew stories of people, of authors um, for whom the process had dragged on so long and it hurt their tenure chances. And so I said, I wanted in writing, although not in the contract guarantees about how long it would take between my submission of a finished manuscript and um, seeing something in print. So I, I had the editor write that down in email um, so that if it came to it, I could kind of remind him that he had promised this. What can you tell us? What was the timeline from proposal to it being published for, at Cambridge? So the, I submitted my proposal in January 2021. Um, the book came out in March 2023. Um, so from proposal, so it was about a little over two years, exactly as Raina had said. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, another question I wanted to ask you: Could you talk a little bit about your working relationship with your editor? over the course of the entire um, project? Were there specific things that he from you in the, either the revision process or something else? Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I'm, I'm smiling because Cambridge, uh, <laughs> there was not much of a working relationship <laughs> with my editor. Um, Cambridge is a really big shop. Um, they have a ton of books. Um, they are a very prestigious press, but they are not, um, the, if you want a press that's going to really go to bat for you and market your book and do a lot of one on one work throughout the process, that is not the press for you. You need to be somewhat uh, capable of doing some of the stuff yourself. So once I got the contract from him, I don't think I heard back from my editor uh, until I asked him why the paperback had not actually been released on time. And I was told that they'd made a mistake and it came out a month later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I think, again, presses work really differently. Um, I, I was in communication with other people at Cambridge, um, you know, the copy editor and things like that. But I had very little communication from my editor. Okay. Uh, the the kind of last thing I just want to ask you, um, do you have any advice, you know, especially for PhD students now as they are thinking about their dissertation and where they might go in their career? Do you have any advice for them um, that you learned from this book publishing process that you want to share? I mean, I really would echo the, the point about taking some time away from your dissertation. I just think it's so important um, to have some mental space. I think you're so exhausted when you finish your dissertation. Ideally, in the best case scenario, you're also starting a new job. Um, so the last thing you wanna be doing is then trying to force out this book that you really don't wanna look at again. Um, I probably took about a year of trying to not think too much about my dissertation. I mean, maybe it was six months, it frankly probably should have been two years, but at Princeton, their expectations are you publish two books before tenure. Um, so I was definitely in a rush to get on that. Um, but yes, I mean, take some time read a lot of books. I mean, what I would recommend is read books that you admire in your field and read a bunch of them and try and figure out what they're doing that made them, make some appeal to you, made them win awards, et cetera. Um, so kind of take inspiration from other authors. And also, as I said, just lean on your network. I mean, your, your advisors don't stop being your advisors when, when they stop officially being your advisors because you've hmm. graduated. They, they continue to be mentors for you throughout the rest of your career. And you should take advantage of that and, you know, also ask for help from your new colleagues. You know, if you are doing a postdoc or, or an assistant professor, talk to your senior colleagues who are there, um, who have published books and ask for their advice because, you know, it, it's the, the worst thing you can do is not ask the right, is not ask questions and just try and do it yourself because you're not gonna be able to do it yourself. Um, so just lean on other people. That's excellent advice. Um... Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And it's interesting to see where there was some overlap with what Raina said, but then obviously differences too, depending on the, the, the press itself and sort of where you're looking to publish. So thank you. Well, let's, um, let's talk with Rachel now. Um, you know, and Rachel brings a lot of experience from copyright and other legal aspects of scholarly publishing. And um, it's, it's good to have her perspective one thing we work with students and faculty a lot is helping them understand some mm -hmm. of these copyright questions, um, publishing questions, um, and really making sure that uh, students and faculty can retain the rights they need <laughs> as they go and publish their work. So, Rachel, we know that 
managing copyright is an important consideration during the book publication process. Could you take us back a little bit and share with us a brief overview of what copyright is, who gets it, what it covers, and why it's important in this um, book publication process? Yeah, no, of course. Um... Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I will try to keep this not too legal easy and um, keep things moving along. So at the most basic level, copyright is the legal mechanism that tells us who owns and who can use an original creative work. It applies to any and all creative expression. So, you know, the obvious things like books, um, novels, paintings, but also things you might not consider to be creative expression, um, like personal emails and even computer code. And the person, by default, the person who gets the copyright is the person who does the creating, although this can be changed in a publication contract or elsewhere. So um, if you read a chapter of your thesis, if you jot down some notes in a class, or even if you sketch a quick doodle during this presentation, you have created a copyrightable work and you hold the copyright in that work from the moment of its creation, um, simply by virtue of being its creator. And I think it's important to understand that copyright exists to protect creators. Um, today's copyright law is based on what's known as the intellectual property clause in the US Constitution. But the very first copyright law actually dates back to the six, late 16th century. Um, and I love the story, so please indulge me for a moment. So after the invention and popularization of the printing press, um, unscrupulous actors began making copies of authors' books and selling those books without the author's permission, um, reaping a profit and ultimately harming those authors' livelihoods since any kind of um, like authorized edition the authors themselves would be selling would then have to compete with these unauthorized editions in the marketplace. So the Statute of Anne was enacted uh, so that only authors could sell and profit from their books for a set period of time. Uh, at the time it was 14 years in order to incentivize those authors to keep on creating. And the same principle motivates today's copyright laws. Without some kind of financial incentive to create, uh, we might get less creative output from authors and from other creators, which would of course be bad for all of us and for society. And what owning a copyright really means is holding a bundle of different exclusive rights in this new creative work you've made. The copyright holder is the only one who can reproduce the work, publish it, distribute it, display it publicly, perform it, create adaptations uh, like foreign language translations or movie editions, or authorize other people to exercise any of those rights. And the copyright holder can also file a lawsuit to stop others from exercising their exclusive rights um, or infringing on their copyright. Copyright protection also lasts for a really long time. You know, I mentioned the initial copyright term was 14 years. Today, it's 70 years after the death of the author. So it lasts for a really long time. And on the question of why copyright is such a key part of publishing um, to begin with, copyright is kind of needed to make publishing work. Um, since the author gets the copyright and the original work they've created, and since those rights are exclusive, the author needs to give their publisher permission to exercise some or all of these rights in order to produce a book. Um, and all of this is handled in the publication contract. A publication contract transforms the kind of unscrupulous behavior I was speaking about a minute ago, um, making copies of a book and selling it without the author's permission into the engine of book distribution, whereby the author benefits from seeing their works reach readers, the publisher benefits by recouping some of their financial investment, um, and we, the reading public, benefit from having this you know, great information out there we can learn and uh, grow from. Let's let's talk a little bit more about um, the legal aspects that are contained within this publishing agreement, um, because I know these can be confusing to a lot of folks, especially for, for new authors who might not have encountered them before. So um, I know within these agreements, there are different sections, like the, the ones called the grant of rights section, where an author might be asked to like transfer their copyright to a publisher in exchange for your book being published, or Maybe you would just be expected to grant an exclusive license or maybe a, a non-exclusive license. So can you walk us through a few of the important like rights related sections of a particular of a typical sort of book publication contract and maybe what authors should sort of look out for? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like Tim said, the grant of rights section is one of the most important parts of the publication contract um, that's related to rights. It sets forth what which of the rights the, auth the author is handing over to the publisher out of those bundle of exclusive rights that copyright provides, um, which will tell us both what the publisher is allowed to do with the work and on what terms. So it covers both which of the rights are being handed over um, at a minimum, you know, reproduction distribution so that publisher can actually create and sell a book, um, but likely some others as well. Uh, I mentioned the display right earlier, which is often necessary to create an ebook edition since it gets displayed on a screen. Um, and it also covers how the book will be produced. So whether the publisher is being granted paperback rights, hardcover rights, ebook rights, um, foreign language translation rights. And on the question of assignments and licenses, um, when a publisher grants, when an author grants a publisher an assignment, what it means is they're uh, assigning their copyright to that publisher. So they're permanently handing over the entire bundle of rights that copyright gives you to the publisher. Um, and maybe it goes without saying, but when that happens, the author is no longer the copyright holder. Um, the publisher takes on this role instead. And this is sometimes referred to as a work for hire arrangement um, in publishing or elsewhere. But if an author instead grants their publisher a license, um, it's not sort of a full transfer of the bundle. So if an author grants their publisher an exclusive license, this means that the author is agreeing to allow the publisher to be the only one who can exercise whatever rights are licensed to the publisher. Um, the difference between an exclusive license and an assignment is that an author who grants an exclusive license still holds the underlying copyright, um, even if they can no longer exercise some of the rights that have been licensed over to the publisher. A non-exclusive license is even more permissive. Um, when an author grants a publisher a non-exclusive license, that means that the author is agreeing to allow the publisher to exercise some of these rights under copyright, but also keeping the right to exercise the rights themselves um, or to license them to another party to allow someone else to exercise those rights as well. And unlike assignments, which are sort of full transfers of copyright, um, licenses can also be limited in time. So an assignment of copyright lasts for the full duration of copyright, the author's life plus 70 years, but a license can be, you know, five years, 10 years, 50 years. Um, but that being said, both exclusive and non-exclusive licenses can last for the full term of copyright. A couple other rights related sections of the publication contract really quickly. Um, one is an author's obligations. So what that author is promising with respect to their manuscript, things like topic and word count, um, but also some more sort of legal promises um, called warranties that the content doesn't infringe anyone else's copyright, um, that it's not defamatory, that it's accurate, and also indemnity obligations where an author is asked to promise for expenses that a publisher incurs if there's a lawsuit involving the book. Another rights related section is the publisher's obligations on getting the, on the road to getting the book to market. Um, things like the timing of publication, you know, whether it will be a simultaneous paperback and hardcover release, uh, what the book will look like, how it will be priced, how it will be advertised and promoted. And then a final rights related section to be aware of is the set of terms that happens when the author and publisher part ways. So what happens if the publisher gets acquired by another publisher? Um, what happens if the book is no longer selling any copies? Or what happens if either the author or the publisher um, violates or breaches any of the terms of the arrangement of the agreement? Um, so if an author is asked to assign their copyright to a publisher, it's really important to be aware that this kind of strips them of all of the rights that they have in the work. Um, so this means that the author can't exercise any of the rights, but also that the publisher can actually sue the author to stop them from doing so, since they now have the kind of full bundle of rights that copyright gives them. Rachel, can you talk a little bit more about um, negotiation of book contracts? Do you have any advice for prospective authors about how to approach and engage in productive negotiations based on all of these terms that, that you sort of mentioned? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so it like Authors Alliance talks to authors all the time who are getting their first book contract, who have published a bunch of books. 
Um, and we often hear from authors who, who didn't really read their contract carefully or who didn't even realize that they could negotiate. Um, so it, uh, it might sound a bit silly, but the, the very first thing that an author should do is read the contract in full. Um, and I'll, I'll say here too, like they can contain a lot of legalese and industry speak, which can be really intimidating for authors. Um, but it's important to read the whole thing and know from the start that publishing contracts can be negotiated. Um, publishers' willingness right. to negotiate is going to vary a lot. And I think some authors often think that they've gotten this document that's sort of on a take it or leave it basis. Um, but you can't always negotiate, even though, you know, we acknowledge it's something that's really hard. Um, when a contract seems confusing, you know, relying on your network of, um, like Rebecca was saying, talking to folks in your network who have experience with these things can be a great idea. Um, Authors Alliance will often provide author authors with information about just this type of thing. Like, what does this contract clause mean? I got this, I don't know what to do. Um, but you can also ask your publisher to explain something that seems unclear. Um, what, and then finally, as once you understand exactly what you're being asked to agree to, I think it's important to take some time and consider um, what's most important to you. So if a simultaneous release in paperback and hardcover is important to you, keeping that in mind as sort of your first priority. Um, it's also good to think about, you know, what's sort of like a something you can live with that's not ideal, whether there are any deal breakers in your contract that would cause you to walk away. Um, and then this next part, I'm going to make it sound simple, but I know it's really hard. Um, you simply write a polite, concise email asking the, your publisher to change certain language, um, and then off you go on negotiations. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, this is easier said than done. You know, publishers have lawyers, they have contract departments, um, they have tons of experience negotiating and their boilerplate and the different versions of contracts they have whereas authors usually don't have these same resources. Um, there are folks, there are literary attorneys and literary agents that can help a lot. Um, as Tim mentioned, I used to work as a literary agent, um, but the flip side is that this costs money. You know, If you're just getting your first book deal and you're hoping to sell your scholarly book, um, I think a lot of authors aren't in the position to start with an agent or literary attorney. And finding a literary agent is its own kind of can of worms that I could talk a lot more about, and I won't. <laughs> um, so if you're trying to negotiate your contract, I think it's good to prepare for some back and forth. Um, publishers are unlikely to immediately acquiesce to everything you've asked for. Um, whether or not you have to like actually threaten to walk um, is, I think, a different question. But... We also find, or we've heard, and I think this is true, that um, publishers can be a lot more willing to make concessions and negotiate when an author comes to the table prepared to explain their position. So if you really care about having your book um, priced so that students can afford it, or um, or again, it's that, that there's a simultaneous hardcover and paperback release, it's important to share that with your publisher upfront um, because it can make a difference in the contractual terms you're offered and in what contractual terms will work for you. Um, I will finish up this question by saying that contract negotiation and like making sense of the contract is a really huge issue for all authors. Um, we have Authors Alliance has a bunch of different educational resources, and one of them is a 200-something page guide to understanding and negotiating publication contracts. Um, it contains sample clauses, negotiating strategies, success stories, um, a lot more than I can cover here today. But when I'm done talking, I'm going to drop the link to that and a few other things in the chat so you can check it out to learn more. Awesome. Uh, Rachel, one final thing I wanted to ask about. So, um, you outlined, of course, that, you know, we receive copyright in the things that we create um, as authors and scholars. Could, I want to get your thoughts and maybe some advice about what authors should know about third party rights, because, of course, you know, you might want to incorporate someone else's photo or graphic into your book. Um, and obviously it's not yours, so you don't have copyright in it and you might need to get permission or you might need to leverage one of these safety valves on the copyright. So can you give us a sense of some of the considerations that authors might need to think about in securing 
like third party rights to incorporate into your book project? Yeah, um, clearing permissions and third party rights is I think another really tough part of the publishing process. Publication contracts will usually place this responsibility with the author. So if you wanna include something in your book that you didn't create um, like an image or um, we, you know, we heard this a lot with like epigraphs, uh, you as the author are usually responsible for tracking down a rights folder, getting permission to use that content and um, making a kind of like mini contract, a, a license agreement for that third party content. And I think it's hard because publication contracts almost always place this burden with the author, um, but it's a sort of legal part of publishing and often authors don't get a lot of guidance. It's It can be pretty intimidating. Um, so I'll say here, we actually have another one of our guides is about third party permissions. Um, we put it out just a couple of years ago and it has a lot more information than I can cover in a few minutes, um, but I'm gonna give you a quick rundown to the extent that I can do that. So, you know, I mentioned the default arrangement is that the author clears and pays for third party permissions. Um, but like everything else, this is something you can negotiate and it will be spelled out in the publication contract. Um, so it's it's one of those things that you can ask for upfront um, as you're negotiating. Either an author can ask the publisher to help them in some way, um, anything from you know, a financial arrangement where the publisher contributes to permissions, um, to the publisher agreeing to provide the author some guidance, to the publisher agreeing to send the author um, forms they can use to get permission. Um, another really big consideration when securing rights and images or other third party content is whether you need permission in the first place. So, you know, Tim, you mentioned these safety valves. Um, I think one of those, one of the important ones in this context is the doctrine of fair use. So fair use um, is a special exception within copyright law that lets you use others' work um, without permission in certain circumstances when it's used for certain purposes. Um, fair use is like medium complicated. I won't, I won't give you the fair use story. That's something I do pretty often as a copyright attorney. Um, but basically when you're using someone else's work for purposes like commentary, criticism, scholarly research, teaching, um, sometimes you don't need permission at all. Another important consideration um, is that the process takes some time. You know, it can take a long time to find a rights holder, um, to come to an agreement with that rights holder, to send the payment, get, getting everything sealed and signed and dotted. Um, so it's a good idea to start out early in the process if you know you've got some third party permissions you need to clear, um, but not before you have a publication contract. Um, when we were putting together our permissions guide, I talked to an editor who said she would work with authors who had like started to clear all their third party permissions and track down rights holders. And um, then a publisher gets involved and they have to sort of like backtrack or, um, you know, make sure what the author asked for lines up with what the publisher actually needs. So it's something that comes after the publication contract. Um, and finally, it's really important to think about your budget. So like I said, authors are often responsible for paying for third party rights um, and the fees can add up really quickly. So keep your budget in mind. Um, think about how many permissions you actually need. And consider asking the rights holder, you know, the person you track down as owning this third party content, whether they're willing to give you a free permission. Um, I think especially when authors are like really passionate about their projects, um, when it's a smaller project, when it's a scholarly project, uh, rights holders are more likely to give um, those authors free permissions than for sort of like big trade books. Right on. Well, thank you so much for that crucial information. I know the legal stuff can be confusing to, to a lot of people. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, Reina, and Rebecca um, for engaging with these questions. I'm going to stop the recording now and we're going to open it up to anyone in the chat or anyone um, on the Zoom that wants to ask uh, questions to any of our panelists. So let me go ahead and do that right now.